case you are not able to hear me, let me know. Uh, you already had a session yesterday on China, India's evolving strategy towards China by Professor Narada. And he broadly, I think if I understood him right, mentioned there is a tremendous opportunity to engage a rising China. But at the same time, there is also assessment that China is a threat. I personally think more than threat, China is a challenge. It's in the long run that China is going to impact us rather than in the short run. But interesting question that I was raising yesterday and I will perhaps deal with it today as I talk of the challenges uh, is how do you deal with this threat and opportunity simultaneously appearing on the horizon? Do we know the threat? Uh, do we uh, deal with the threat? Do we overlook the threat? What should be the strategy so that we can really approach China in a sense of partnership, which is the buzzword these days? I thought we need to understand where are we located and how we should understand the threat before we think of dealing with it. Second thing that Professor Nalabhat also mentioned yesterday very clearly during his uh, presentation uh, was the threat of Islamic State. Abu Bakr al Baghdadi has declared helicopter. They are in control of an enormous territory in Syria and Iraq. And he, I was very impressed when he said we need 18 months of eliminating this threat, otherwise we may not be able to eliminate. And I sitting there thought that we are talking of then perhaps us moving in a situation which potentially may be described as World War III. Lots of experts believe that terrorism is actually World War III. Like Cold War, it took us 15 years to understand we are in Cold War. Maybe it will take us 50 years to understand we were already in World War III. So that is a new kind of threat which is appearing right from Boko Haram in Africa to Sydney and of course Peshawar, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. That's one generic threat writ large in the face of the world. So I thought if you look at the geopolitical landscape of Asia now, it is redefining itself. Because the fundamental threat which is shared by everybody is no longer the one which Westphalian system can help us deal with. Westphalian system was meant primarily to protect citizens and provide welfare to citizens within a delimited territory, defined territory. But none of the threats now, and this is the most important threat today, is of course no longer a threat which can be handled within your borders, even if you are a superpower like the United States. So fundamentally we notice that the landscape is shifting, the geopolitics is shifting, is shifting primarily because of this new threat <coughs> which is visible. And that reminds me of a very famous saying of one of the legendary German chancellors, you possibly know his name, Otto von Bismarck. He was describing the shift, tremendous shifts in Europe and he said something very interesting. He said strong is weak because of his or her scruples and weak is strong because of his or her audacity. That can apply to India-Pakistan relationship, that can apply to North Korea-United States relationship and of course audacity of hope is in different context that President Obama gave us. But it's a very interesting understanding of how audacity of a non-state actor is making stronger actors who are bound with scruples of procedures and law. is making bigger powers, weaker and stronger powers, or stronger, uh, stronger powers, weaker and weaker powers, strong. That simultaneously leads us to understanding that the landscape which is changing, the politics which is changing was not only determined, maintained, sustained, but also led so far by the United States. And understanding of what power, an asymmetric equation of power therefore, that understanding itself is changing. 
All of you know Joseph Nyland, diffusion of power. Not only from east to west, from Atlantic, North Atlantic to Asia Pacific, but also from state to non-state actors, and not just terrorists, intellectuals, novel laureates, NGOs, all kind of university students. Power is diffusing in that sense. So that, in that trend of diffusion of power is where this group that has emerged. There was only an understanding power is diffusing in diffusion of power, usurpation of, usurpation of power by a particular non-state actor here. And that is in some ways defining the geopolitical landscape in which we are located. Henry Kissinger, recent book was on World Order, he says in this changing landscape, India seems to be at the threshold of shifting from a unipolar movement or what he calls the hegemonic world order to a concert of nations which is multipolar world. And India is getting impacted upon by these tremendous changes but also is beginning to impact on these changes. And he of course credited India's uh, great leadership, India's traditions, geography, culture to say why India is able to begin to influence that shift which is occurring. So India is shifting from what he originally, in his older books on like diplomacy, he talks of system shaping, of system determining powers, and system influencing powers, and what he calls systems ineffectuals. There are three kinds of actors in determining geopolitical world orders. India is now being described as power proximate, which is at least able to influence powers that have system shaping capacity. So if this is the landscape of geopolitics and this is where India is located at the rising, how do we then deal with China? Rising China, rising and emerging India, I'm sure all of you know rising means with emerging as system shaping universities. Emerging is space expanding but not as their system shaping universities. So that, that's why India is called emerging power and China is called rising power. So how do they have an interface between the two of them? Let me list five or six fundamental challenges and I will blow them. <coughs> Our policy these days is described other than multi alignment and strategy economy. It is also in diplomatic terms, in operational terms, for multi vectored policy. We are trying to be friendly or in partnership with everybody from Iran to the United States to Soviet Russia, Russia, Russia and also China. And this, in, in some ways, is generating contesting interests within the country, contesting constituencies. I sometimes used to talk about six constituencies that determine India-China policy. Three plus three. Three in the first 30 years, and other three joining in the last 30 years. First 30 years, we had only three kinds of people. Diplomats who were posted in China or had to deal with China very limited number, army officers and soldiers who were either posted on border or had postings in China. And third, very limited number of linguists who understood what Chinese meant. Incidentally, given greatly forward and cultural revolution and the tensions, all three had negative opinions on China. And the three new constituencies we were added in the last 30 years, very clearly, I sometimes Apologies before I mention the word small town, small time traders. <coughs> you know, aircrafts going to China are probably full of people talking in vernacular languages. So I say very noisy, sometimes fighting. But they are the largest new number going to China. And they are great beneficiaries. So they always have positive opinion. Second category is about 10,000, 11,000 Indian students now in China. That's also a new constituency given a Fantastic separate building, India houses, Indian food, relatively good infrastructure in China compared to us. They also have a very positive opinion on China. There are of course a lot of other combined people who are tourists, academics, journalists, who are short term travelers. If you go to China for two days, you come really wow. You know, somebody said in a preface of a book saying if you live in China for two weeks, you come back and you will write a book. If you stay there for six months, you will write an article. If you stay there for a year, you will never write it. Because you will be too confused because you would have seen Hato in other areas by that time. How 
complex in the reality of the ground. So short term travelers are all very, very enamored with you know, neon lights and white expressways and everything that has come. So these are constituencies, and then now add to these constituencies pro American constituencies, pro European Union constituencies. So tremendous constituencies contesting within the country, whether they are in parliament or in bureaucracy or in academia. The first challenge is how do we elaborate that? How do we turn that into a strength rather than a weakness? Like our population used to be a weakness at some stage, now youth bulge is being projected as a strength of India. So how do we turn this multiple constituencies that produce multivectoral policy? Because we have to provide a certain hierarchy of interest. We have to provide a certain calibration of how we want to pursue policies, making sure no relationship is built at the cost of the other, which is very difficult. So I assume prioritizing our interests will give some direction to these constituencies and calibrating, maneuvering them such that they are able to produce maximum outcome the fundamental challenge because you remember Jawaharlal Nehru on whose name my university is uh, set up, was one of the first intellectuals to say foreign policy is a reflection of domestic politics. And you saw when coalition politics reflected itself in terms of the US military team, which I think is very likely to talk, how coalition politics was driving the domestic politics. So setting domestic politics in order would be the first important challenge for India to deal with China in terms of milking the cow, I think somebody said this. Second important challenge for us is moving immediately outside your house to the immediate periphery. Last 15 years, it seems we have lost our immediate neighborhood gradually one after another to China's rising omnipresence and China's rising influence. So whether it is uh, Sri Lanka or it is Nepal or it is Bangladesh, it seems Chinese are investing more, Chinese are trading and importing and exporting more and in fact advising. One could see certain speeches of let's say a Chinese ambassador in Kathmandu. Look at the tone and tenor of some of these speeches. And I don't want to elaborate, but that is another major issue for us that even in the subcontinent he seems to have been shrunk. And China's role in SAR, even as an observer, is extremely encouraged. How do we deal with that? That is the second challenge. Because unless you are comfortable at home and in your immediate neighborhood, you will not be able to partner with the Chinese and you will be obsessed with that. How do we do that? Chinese have tremendous resources, 4.1 trillion dollars of foreign exchange. I mean, checkbook diplomacy is a very famous expression now. The Chinese can go and sign checks and you know, do big concessions. The recent one is that they went to United Kingdom. And they have given them a contracts worth uh, uh, 40 billion dollars of investments. And what did they get in return? UK says in joint statement, item number 23, I think, it's a 30 item joint statement. Uh, Tibet is integral part of China. That's what Chinese get in return. So they have this tremendous money, economic prowess. How do we deal with that? Let me be very quick. We have tremendous advantage of geography and cultural communication and connections, historical connections. Can we take advantage of that, of our historical, historical connections, uh, both geographical and cultural, and build infrastructure? If you understand the cost of losing influence, then making concessions to immediate neighbors will become relatively agreeable. Sometimes you ask me, why should we make concessions to immediate neighbors? But if you look at the cost you will pay if you don't do that, then that becomes fairly attractive and you should think that as a possibility. And that's another challenge for us to be with it so that we can then from a position of strength feel more comfortable and have a fresh assessment of China threat and think of partnership. The third one of course is the whole specific set of issues where we have to respond. For example, maritime silk route or South China Sea or issues of act east from the east. This seems to bring India and China into a certain contention. India clearly is not comfortable in endorsing Xi Jinping's uh, proposal of uh, Southern Silk Group or Maritime Silk Group. But our neighbors are. 
India is not comfortable in allowing upgradation of China's uh, observer status to a full membership, but all neighbors are. So how do we deal with that situation? One possibility is to tie up with the United States, have very emphatic uh, and troublesome statements in the joint strategic vision saying that you know, we want to enforce UNCLOS in, in terms of ensuring freedom of navigation for road flights in South China Sea, which is a core interest of China. It's like Kashmir for us. At least the way they perceive it. It's very important for them that you're saying you're going to go and ensure security there. That's one possibility of dealing with it. Other possibility is immediately ensuring that your foreign minister goes there and they will do brief as to what went on during this period. So, calibration and knowing is important there. Uh, I think that not much time left. Let me quickly move on to the next one. The uh, fourth challenge uh, then would be an immediate area, which is where the whole issue of terrorism seems to be breeding in Afghanistan. We all know that uh, in full swing there is preparation that international assistance force should move out and uh, local forces should take over and local forces are not in position. So there is talk about whether the immediate neighbors would come in and help in that situation. There is a conversation that the Shanghai Cooperation Organization should be on the lead led by China. Russians are very reluctant. So that would create a situation where this will reinforce China-Pakistan relationship in dealing with terrorism simply because Pakistan is the one that knows best what is going on inside. And Chinese are the best in terms of resources. Where would it be in India in that case? Should we stay away? Because even old friend Russia is not much closer to Chinese. After their $4 billion energy deal and a lot of technology transfers, and the fact that India is drifting towards the US, China-Russia relationship has become very close. So in some ways, you potentially might see Russia, China, Pakistan. Russia not so much actively involved. Do you want to lose that ground? Because if we lose that ground to China-Pakistan, that brings out the old nightmare that we have had of China-Pakistan relationship being anti-India, trying to contain India, squeeze India, trouble India. How do we deal with, with that situation? And I think we had a detailed lecture on Afghanistan, I'm sure. I missed that part, but the Ambassador Soon must have dealt with some of the issues as to what can India do. So I don't want to detail on that very quickly, very, very clearly. Last two points is one of the fundamental flaw in India-China relationship which keeps us you know, feeling so dwarfed by China is trust deficit. At the core of the relationship, if I have to define the relationship in one word, it's a relationship of trust deficit. We overreact to situations, uh, we get paranoid and I think that's, something, that's what leads to sometimes assessment of China flooding us. Whereas Chinese investments are, are seen with caution all around the world. China's technology transfers, where are they happening? They're happening in Africa, they're happening in Latin America, but they're not majorly happening, let's say, to developed world. They're manufacturing what is designed in developed world, that's a separate matter. It's not Chinese technology being invested in those things. So not only us in India are very cautious of not allowing them to get into our telecommunication ports and other strategic <coughs> infrastructure. The whole world is cautious. So why are we, as I think, uh, again, because an Alabama said, why are we not cautious when we get, get, get technology from the United States? They are no uh, angels compared to you. Look at NSA was snooping on all your leaders and they were snooping on Angela Merkel also along the line. So why do we worry about Chinese uh, uh, potential surveillance of us or, or intruding into our agencies? How do we deal with that trust deficit at the core of our mindset? I think is a major challenge. Maybe one could talk of confidence building measures, people to people, contacts, knowing each other much more, exchanges, etc. etc. Last point is how do we play as a swing state? You know, India is often described as a swing state. And it seems we are clearly swinging in favor of the United States. And people are almost beginning to talk about the United States uh, replacing the Soviet Union not just as a supplier of weapons to us, but also in terms of becoming quasi-alliance uh, relationship in the coming years. Are we comfortable with that? Because that will make China very really paranoid. China is paranoid with this. How do we play that swing state uh, status? 
know, there was a time when India had problem with Pakistan and you know, we signed up August 2021 Treaty of Friendship with Soviet Union. Is it that now we have trouble with China, so we sign up something with the United States? Is that something we want to repeat? Normally we don't repeat history in the same fashion. We evolve and we sort of make it far more refined and uh, much better than what we did last time. So I think on that swing state status also one has to really see how do we deal with this challenge of being witnessed as moving in favor of uh, the United States, which is raising a lot of uh, red herrings in Beijing, particularly when you sign certain documents like the visual statement which mentions specifically on South China Sea or talk of expansionism by Indian Prime Minister goes to Japan. Where do we deal with it? Should Indian Prime Minister think of taking an early visit? It was planned for February, I think it's been postponed. That is, I think, a fundamental two things. How do we deal with trust deficit? How do we deal with our status of swing state being received at international level? And the whole new framework which is emerging, which the US would like to put us, is Indo-Pacific. That again, if you remember, just one minute more, sir, please. I remember Sham Saran, who's now the convener of National Security Advisory Board. He, in, in one of the lectures, had laid out a very interesting formulation how the pivot is shifting from West Asia. From the 70s, Japan was the rising power, which was not a threat to the United States. So the pivot to Asia was West Asia for the United States. And how that has shifted to east of offshore balancing because it's not Japan which is right now, it's China which is right now. So how do we play with this landscape changing, new geopolitical formulations being you know, put up front saying this is the Indo-Pacific region and this is where Indo and India are supposed to plug in very well and Chinese are supposed to be outliers in that. So United States has a certain design of how it wants to ensure that not only in 20th century but also in 21st century even when the geopolitics shifts from North Atlantic to Asia Pacific, it stays on top. That's what the United States wants. That even if we shift geopolitical headquarters or let's say gravitation point from North Atlantic to Asia Pacific, it should stay on top. That's why this Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's why this Indo-Pacific formulation of geopolitical framework, how do we engage in these, in these new discourses? I want to conclude by saying that I often say if China was to look around the world as to which country can it use to engage the United States in terms of building bridges, <coughs> India fits the bill very well. Because among the friends of the United States, India is least problematic for the Chinese government. That's why the new leadership took over. The Prime Minister had to visit some country immediately to say, I am the new Prime Minister. He almost imposed his visit to India because he couldn't have visited any other country in the neighborhood. So India is still seen as least problematic by Chinese. Should we potentially think of dealing with this challenge of security over assessment and desire for partnership with China by using India as a bridge to get China into the international system, which is what we did in 60s and 50s. Remember the debates on the Security Council in the seat. That's what we had done earlier. And maybe that role potentially we can play, but that's again tremendous challenge because, as I said, you can't repeat history in the same fashion because people are aware of what India did earlier and what India can do. But this tremendous collaboration of various forces and various interests that are contesting between themselves, that collaboration I think is a fundamental challenge both at home and in conducting diplomacy and foreign policy abroad. I'll close here. Thank you very much.